Senior Scholar and Program Area Director of Youth Development at Child Trends. Dr. Moore studies trends in child and family well-being, adolescent development, effective programs and practices, the determinants and consequences of adolescent parenthood, the effects of poverty and welfare on children, and positive development. She served as a member of the National Advisory Council of the National Institute on Child Health and Human Development. She is a founding board member of the International Society for Child Indicators and the founding chair of the Effective Programs and Research Task Force for the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's excellent to be here. I want to share um, findings from a project that Child Trends did in collaboration with Futures Without Violence, um, with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm not going to comment on the high levels of violence in the U.S. relative to other developed nations, except to point out the huge differences across countries and across regions in the United States, as that this means that violence is malleable. That is, the levels of violence we experience can be changed. I'm also not going to comment on the well-documented negative consequences, pain, and repercussions of violence, except to acknowledge its importance. Personally, I would rather focus on positive youth development. But this project and a review of the research has convinced me that we must focus on preventing violence, and we can. I, want, I hope everyone has a copy of this brief because I think they'll be referring to it. We won't be able to see the TV. Um, I want you to consider slide two, and that's figure A in the research brief that I hope you all have. To be Across the top are the outcomes of violence for youth. That is, the consequences of violence among youth. They include child maltreatment, bullying perpetration, delinquency and crime, gang violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, suicide, self-harm, and general aggression. <coughs> Along the side are the causes and the determinants of violence. And these determinants are organized by ecological domain. That is, the individual level determinants first, then family level determinants, then school level determinants, and then community or societal level determinants. The X's in the table mean there's a correlation that the determinant is a predictor of the youth outcome. And if you see a large, bold, dark X, that means the evidence is strong and clear. A large X that is not full means the evidence is moderate. And a small X means the association is weak, perhaps because there isn't an association, or perhaps because the topic hasn't yet been studied. But the point isn't to look at the individual cells. Rather, the point is to look across the rows and let the consistency of the evidence sink in. For example, look at child maltreatment, which is the top row under family. You can see that maltreatment of a child increases the likelihood that that child will experience every single type of violence. A child who is abused or neglected is more likely to mistreat their own child, to bully, to be delinquent, or join a gang, to commit partner violence or other sexual violence, and also to have a high risk of suicide and self-harm. Similarly, a child whose family is characterized by domestic violence or intimate partner violence has a greater risk of being engaged in every type of youth violence. On the other hand, some associations are less strong than people might expect. Looking at the top row, for example, mental health, you can see that the evidence is thin. Persons with mental health issues are slightly more likely to be violent than peers, but only slightly so. Unfortunately, the coverage given to violent incidents by persons with mental health issues has added to the stigma so often associated with mental health issues. Of course, there are many reasons to address mental health. Among them, the fact that people with mental health issues are more likely to be victims of violence. And mental health issues combined with substance use is a risk factor. 
In fact, substance use is strongly linked to delinquency and crime and to suicide, and there is moderate evidence of a link between substance use and intimate partner violence, self-harm, and general aggression. Well, turning to the family level, harsh parenting, like child maltreatment and domestic violence, is consistently linked to later youth violence. And this association suggests international patterns of violence and highlights the importance of intervening with families. As I noted, the purpose of this chart is to highlight determinants of youth violence that have implications for many kinds of violence. At the school level, you can see that school connectedness and school conduct, and with more moderate evidence, school performance and antisocial peers matter. At the community level, there is emerging evidence regarding media and gun availability, but strong evidence about collective efficacy. Our review also suggests some unexpected determinants with implications for intervention. For example, there is a theme across levels that youth who are positively connected to supportive families, schools, and communities are less likely to engage in violence. Positive social connections are clearly important to lowering levels of violence. Significantly, the prevention of unintended pregnancy represents another way to prevent violence that may be unexpected by some. While the evidence is only emerging for unintended pregnancy, it is moderately associated with several violent outcomes. Most important, many of the determinants of violence reflect issues we would want to address anyhow. We want to address school success, child abuse, substance use, domestic violence, and unintended pregnancy. There is an added value in that they are all related to violence. Well, turning to the next slide, uh, which is also available in the handout uh, the at the very back of the research brief. Yeah. So this slide divides determinants into risk and protective factors. Um, specifically, it uses hexagons to depict the risk and protective factors at each age that could be addressed by interventions. Again, my focus is not on the details, um, but you're welcome to read the full report. What I want to highlight is that much is known about the risk and protective factors for violence. In this slide, the risk and protective factors are again depicted at the individual, family, school, and community levels. And the columns show age groups. In each hexagon, protective factors are depicted in the top part. All risk factors are shown in the bottom portion of the hexagon. For example, going down the early childhood column, that's the column on the far left, you'll see that an individual level child variable is, is having an easy temperament. A child with an easy temperament has an individual protective factor. Risk factors at the child level include poor self-control, impulsivity, dysregulated sleep, and antisocial behavior. Then going down to the family level, again, there are protective factors. Consistent, warm, and responsive parenting. The risk factors are maltreatment, insecure attachment, harsh parenting, the parent's mental illness, the parent's substance use, domestic violence, and unintended pregnancy. Going down further to the school, obviously these kids are too young to be in school, so we're really talking childcare, warm, responsive care in a childcare setting. Uh, whereas a risk factor is developmentally inappropriate early childcare. And at the community level, positive uh, supportive factor is collected efficacy and resources at the community level, whereas media violence, community violence, and gun policy can have a negative effect. Then going across, I want to show the age variation at the families, which is the orange row. You can see that consistent, warm, and responsive parenting actually is important at all ages, right through adolescence. The specifics of it, of course, vary from infancy through adolescence, but the idea is the same. Children need consistent, warm, and responsive parenting, and as adolescents, they need parental monitoring as well. When they're young adults and they're forming their own families and relationships, then it's having healthy relationships and their parents being positive parents. On um, the risk side, you can see that they're really the same also across the different age groups in terms of the concepts. The specifics, again, um, vary 
as kids get older. And the circles at the bottom indicate the, the measures of risk. You'll see that a young child, the first circle in red, who is showing developmentally inappropriate early aggression as a marker of risk at a very young age, but we do see those markers for young children. Um, the end of uh, middle childhood, children may start to develop conduct disorders, physical, <coughs> verbal, and cyber aggression. Um, they may become bullies, um, and they may start to engage in self-harm. Similarly, at the end of adolescence, uh, the same kinds of behaviors may be seen, but also suicide. The main takeaway, really, from this table is that much is known about what the risk and protective factors are for violence. If we want to reduce violence, we need to enhance the protective factors and minimize the risk factors. And as subsequent speakers will attest, much is known about effective interventions for individuals, families, schools, and communities. Though we seem to know least about community strategies. The critical thing to note about this chart is that it doesn't focus focus solely on risk factors. It's important to minimize the factors that elevate the likelihood of violence, absolutely. But it is also critical to enhance the protective factors experienced by individuals, families, and uh, communities, as well as the larger, larger society, because enhancing protective factors can also reduce violence. In sum, violence is a malleable behavior levels of violence can be reduced. Second, there are common determinants of violence, and addressing critical common determinants, the risk and protective factors, can have a range of beneficial effects. Third, we know what the major risk and protective factors for violence are, with the caveat that we need to better understand the societal, community, and cultural factors that are related to violence. And lastly, we need to tackle not only risk factors, but also strengthen protective factors, like improving school climate. Thank you.